when we were inviting Mr. Vitello Vignoli a few months ago, and he gladly accepted our invitation, which made us very happy, he proposed a few titles to choose from. One of the titles was Digital Sovereignty. I think there is no better way to develop a trust other by accomplishing digital sovereignty. Therefore, I can say that I'm so excited to hear the presentation of Mr. Vignoli and that I'm so glad that we have him today with us. So I will end my welcome speech by inviting Mr. Vignoli. And before that, I want to thank you all for the attention and for being with us today. Thank you. And Mr. Vignoli, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the introduction. And uh, uh, I hope to meet the expectation uh, to, with, my, with my talk. Let me uh, share my screen uh, to start the presentation. Okay, so uh, the, the title uh, is uh, rather clear. Um, free open source software and of course hardware and open standards for digital sovereignty. First, uh, let's try to uh, to, to establish what is digital sovereignty is basically uh, the ability of uh, individuals, of course, uh, but of uh, um, governments or organizations or uh, uh, organizations like the European Union to provide the technologies that are critical for uh, the welfare of citizens, I would say, that are critical for the citizens to be real citizens today and to, and to leverage all their uh, rights as citizens and to be competitive. And uh, to develop this kind of technologies uh, to avoid being, uh, to, to, to avoid uh, handing over this kind of tools which are uh, strategic for, uh, uh, for countries, uh, for uh, uh, individuals, for companies, for, uh, for the global uh, world we are in today, uh, to, to uh, express ourselves, to get our rights, to be real citizens. When uh, I was born, which is uh, uh, almost 70 years ago, of course, the situation was completely different. Everything was on paper. Um, and, uh, but today, everything uh, or most of the things uh, are digital. And in the future, the, the number will, will grow. Um, we need to be able to access digital information in a transparent way. Everyone, uh, when it access digital information, should see the same thing, should read the same document, should see the same video, should listen to the same audio. So how to achieve this technology sovereignty? It's through open standards. There's no other choice. Open standards are uh, key for uh, the freedom of individuals and the freedom of individuals within uh, a large organi social organization like a state, a country, a region, a city, or a, a continent like Europe, or if we go even one step further, as a global citizens. Um, we speak different languages, uh, we have different cultures, so the more we can share our cultures, the more we can uh, share our knowledge without uh, uh, relying on, on tools which are difficult to share, the more we grow together, which I think uh, is uh, the best way forward uh, that I can imagine today. Unfortunately, this is not what is happening. Uh, you know, the the acronym GAFAM uh, is Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft. 
this uh, uh, that I'm showing uh, is uh, more or less like a joke about uh, what is happening, but the reality is not so far from this. We, uh, what we do, if we rely on the tools that these companies provide us, we are filtered um, basically to exchange our knowledge. Uh, we go through technologies that do not allow to do that in a transparent way, but that are filter in some way between uh, the two of us or groups. Uh, and this uh, is not what should happen. Unfortunately, the situation is really bad. If we look at what happened uh, with the uh, human genes names, uh, and, and I'm talking about human genes. The human genes are probably the most uh, uh, deep and personal component on, of an individual is what makes us uh, unique. And uh, human genes have been renamed to please Excel because Excel was not able to import human genes names as they were conceived by the scientific community and was introducing errors. So people that were sharing uh, human genes, uh, re reports about human genes using Excel received uh, documents that were uh, impossible to understand because Excel changed that. But instead of having Excel, change, which was probably the logical and the, the choice, the, the scientific community had to change the human genes name because Microsoft refused to update Excel, which I think is just unbelievable. And it's a sign of the situation we are in. And uh, in Europe, we, we have a um, I'm showing you uh, uh, some data about what happens in, in Europe. Uh, these are data which are really recent. Um, they are all uh, uh, from reports announced in 2021 or 2020. So really, really recent. So there has been a, a report about what the lobby of large technology com companies are uh, doing in in europe and i think that when i will show next slide with the numbers so with the with the amount of money which is invested uh, you will uh, just understand uh, what is happening so look at what technology companies uh, are spending only in europe this is brussels is not the entire europe is the European Union. So uh, technology is by far the industry that spends more on lobby. And uh, as technology is not uh, one of the most controversial industry, yes, of course, we have the issue of uh, recycling uh, old hardware uh, or recycling uh, um, technology hardware, uh, which is obsolete. Uh, but if you look at the names, uh, you see more software company than hardware company. And uh, so the question is why software company that have not uh, issues about polluting the world, that have not issues about uh, um waste uh, solid waste uh, uh, are uh, investing amounts of dollars or euros which are really huge and this is again this is brussels then uh, they have budget which is not as easy or as public as it is in brussels in each state. So you can understand uh, the influence of these uh, lobby budgets. What happens is that uh, there are more lobbyists than uh, uh, people in the parliament, in the European parliament. 
And of course, uh, the fact is that by with this activity, with this lobby activity, these companies are influencing what happens in uh, at European level in terms of uh, technology choices. And in addition to their to the money these companies spend directly, they also employ a network of uh, lobby groups, uh, law firms that represent their interest. Of course, uh, what that what this means, it means that when there are meetings uh, with the European Commission about uh, digital technologies, you see uh, 52 meetings uh, with NGOs, consumer organization and trade unions, and uh, the rest uh, is uh, with companies, trade associations, think tanks, or whatever. So there is a disproportionate effort uh, between the citizens, which are represented by NGOs, consumer organization, and trade unions, and the companies that are influencing the development of the European policies and are, and as a consequence are influencing the development of uh, the European countries technology policies. Uh, all this uh, has been analyzed by this book which uh, is an incredibly interesting. I really invite you to have a look at this book uh, from Professor Shoshana Zuboff. Um, she has uh, defined what the new wave of capitalism uh, is about, and is about surveillance, which means uh, that we are uh, controlled directly or indirectly by software companies and uh, by uh, the use of uh, non standards or false standards. The problem is that uh, we not only have uh, uh, the issue of uh, uh, closed standards, but we also have the issue of uh, uh, false open standards, which is probably even worse. So what is uh, surveillance capitalism? Is, uh, is the fact that uh, with the promise that we get uh, free services and we get uh, informations and the um, tools that allow us uh, uh, to, to, for instance, to plan a trip, uh, uh, to access books online, uh, to access information, uh, the, with, with the promise that everything is free, uh, our profile, is uh, uh, e extracted from uh, the way we use this information. And uh, we, our profile is uh, exchanged to make uh, money. So we, the citizens are products. Although you, it's difficult to figure out that you are a product, you as a person are a product, the reality is that your behavior online makes you a product. And uh, therefore, uh, I will show you a little bit about the mechanism. I hope uh, uh, to, to, you, you, you are able to understand it from my words and, and the visuals. So what the, how it started, it started like uh, users have a behavior uh, in uh, online uh, and the behavior is analyzed and is analyzed to improve the service and then the, the, the improved service is rendered to the user. This was the, let's say the starting point. The problem is that uh, companies uh, that are were providing or are providing these services realize that there is a, a behavior surplus. Um, we provide uh, uh, a feedback on, uh, let's say, our search engine is uh, 
is performing. Our document can represent uh, uh, our contents. How the translation of something uh, is uh, good or bad or satisfactory or could be improved. And uh, the fact is that we provide more than what is needed to improve the service. So the, the, the behavioral surplus uh, uh, provides a way of building new means of productions and uh, to create products that are based on the prediction uh, about the user behavior. So let's say uh, tomorrow I will leave uh, for South Tyrol. And of course, uh, as I will leave for South Tyrol, I have looked at the map and I have booked an hotel and I have looked at the restaurants in South Tyrol. Uh, but in South Tyrol, there is not just uh, food and, and uh, uh, lodging, but you have shops. So I started to receive advertising of shops and services that are in South Tyrol and could be interesting uh, for me as a potential user. So of course, uh, uh, the fact that I will be in South Tyrol for two days has been sold to companies that are selling me, that are trying to sell me services and opportunities and are uh, uh, offering me discounted services or uh, look, uh, it's the week of uh, whatever and uh, you should visit that village because there is a market uh, that can be interesting for you. And this means that I am uh, in fact under surveillance from uh, these companies and I'm under surveillance uh, from uh, in general organizations that provide services online. And as today, organizations that provide services online are the same that provide services offline. The reality is that I am under surveillance from uh, basically the world around me, which may be threatening, as I'm saying it, of course, uh, the more you are uh, uh, aware of this situation, the more you can control the situation, but it's difficult to find and see the threshold between uh, what you are controlling and what the others are providing you. So it's, uh, it's really a situation uh, where we should do something and uh, limit the, this, uh, this unfortunate evolution of course, if uh, all the tools that were in this design were open, we could be able to check and control uh, what, which are the, the information we, are, uh, we were sharing or we are sharing. I mean, I, I don't give a damn about uh, people knowing that I will be in South Tyrol for two days. It's, uh, it's a fact, but I would like to avoid being uh, uh, controlled because I will be in South Tyrol and uh, being controlled by companies that have only the interest of selling me advertising or products. So to make uh, the cycle easier, uh, you start with collecting data from the user and it's easy to collect the data. You look at the map and you search from Bolzano, for instance, in my case, and uh, you, you see, uh, and the data is that I will be traveling for some reasons to Bolzano. Then uh, the data is analyzed and turned into a predictive model, uh, which means that, of course, uh, if it's looking for Bolzano, it will go to Bolzano. And so he will stay there and he needs uh, food and he needs an hotel and he needs uh, to do shopping and um, 
you know, buy water and get a coffee or whatever. So that I sold to businesses that send me advertising. And this means that the data come back to me in a form that is uh, profitable for someone else. And of course, then it comes back to me. And uh, if I confirm, let's say that I book a restaurant, then uh, you have a confirmation that I am moving to South Tyrol, that I'm interested in uh, getting good food in a restaurant and so so forth. So uh, the situation is that we, we really are controlled by the outside world uh, and this, uh, uh, this we, we got there because uh, no one controlled uh, the large technology companies uh, in the technology evolution because people was not aware of the uh, issues that could be collateral to giving out to these companies uh, the power that they have today. What can we do? First, we should start to, to learn about this situation. We should be aware of what happens to our information. Governments should start uh, issuing laws that protect citizens against uh, the surveillance. And government also need to stand up and protect citizens. Uh, this uh, is not just uh, by GDPR, which in Europe uh, has uh, contributed to create, create some awareness, is not enough. Uh, GDPR is about our privacy, but it's not about the tools. So there should be similar laws about the tools and uh, looking after in, in, in the uh, following the presentation, we will see which are the tools that should be implemented. So what, which is the situation in Europe? There is a growing awareness that there is an issue. In some cases, uh, there have been uh, uh, also decisions by European uh, organizations. Uh, what, which are the initiatives? Um, the, the, but there's basically, there is starting to be initiatives, but they're slow. They're slow because uh, they are uh, slowed down by the uh, huge lobbying effort that I was talking before. So building a data framework, which is, uh, an open data framework, promoting uh, an environment where you can trust the, uh, the actors because they provide open uh, tools and open data and rely on open data and adapt competition and regulatory rules. Because the problem is that the more data you have, the more power you have. And the fact is that this uh, at a certain point turns into a monopoly and uh, monopolies have always been an issue in our uh, in our system in our social system and uh, yes there could be solutions but unfortunately the the trend that we see today is too slow there should be an acceleration and uh, Europe, and not only Europe, of course, but as European, we, we care more about Europe. Europe should, uh, and should get to a point where we are aut autonomous in terms of technology. Uh, Europe as a whole and uh, each country uh, for uh, its own needs. Uh, if you think about data, data started as a byproduct of processes then it's become a process enable and then uh, became a product enabler. And uh, when uh, the number of data was uh, significant, data become a product itself. 
So the fact that uh, try to think uh, about uh, yourself, uh, and I'm really talking about each one of us as a product. Uh, I'm an individual, but in, uh, in my case, uh, uh, let's repeat the example of me going to South Tyrol. I'm a, an, um, 70, 67 year old man uh, traveling with his uh, wife to South Tyrol for two days. And therefore, uh, I can buy male product. My wife can buy female products. We will need a restaurant. We will need an hotel. We need petrol for the car. If for emergencies, we need support and so on, so on and so forth. So we are, uh, let's say, two moving products to uh, South Tyrol. And in two days, uh, we should, as products, uh, we should produce as much revenues for South Tyrol as possible. And uh, the reality is that around us, uh, this mechanism uh, over time uh, has generated a system. If uh, you look at this, uh, it's a little bit frightening, but uh, it's the reality. So all uh, this, uh, all uh, the companies, uh, organizations, uh, uh, sectors that are uh, uh, in this uh, in this uh, chart are uh, getting our data in a sense, and they are using our data for uh, their benefit. Of course, uh, the benefit of these companies can also mean in some cases the benefit of individuals if they work in a company but the problem is that uh, they they get the advantage of this industry this uh, profiling industry when they work in a company but as individuals they fall uh, under exactly the same uh, issue because uh, outside their company they are a product once they get out of their comp the company they, they work at, they become a, a product. And uh, this is just an example of two, uh, two companies that are uh, collecting and selling data. So Axiom uh, provides uh, 3,000 attributes for 700 million people in the U United States and Europe. So 3,000 attributes for each person. Um, for instance, I suffer from arthritis on my left hand. And I've bought uh, a support uh, through Amazon. And now I get advertising for pills about arthritis. Uh, unfortunately, the fact that I suffer from arthritis is a, is a health information. So I should uh, show my willingness to share the information before the information is shared. But if the fact that I bought a, something from Amazon uh, actually uh, made the, my health information public. And uh, Oracle, uh, is providing even more attributes but again is not this is just an example it's not to blame these two companies they're just part of the the situation this is just part of the uh, the the global infrastructure of uh, profiling and controlling and surveilling people so which is the current paradigm the current paradigm uh, if we think we can summarize it, we produce the data, they own the data. So the sharing data becomes a, a, a private issue. And on the contrary, we should share the data that we want to share. And the, the benefit of sharing data should go back to individuals. Sharing information 
it's a huge opportunity for today's world. But the problem is that uh, because of this uh, situation, we don't uh, leverage this opportunity. So can we regain control of our data to decide uh, who to share with, under which rules, and when on, for what purposes? Uh, of course, we could set rules based on trust, but believe me, uh, if the data is in the hands of a few, um, then we lose our collective intelligence, which is uh, one of the most powerful uh, tools of the human being. Uh, if we share one idea each, and we are 20 people, we get out of the meeting with 20 ideas. So that is uh, something, but of course, if someone owns the 20 ideas, he will be more powerful than each individual in the meeting. Unfortunately, what happens is that uh, governments in Europe rely on proprietary software for desktop productivity, uh, which, is, uh, which, which are the tools we use to produce data and share data and cloud storage of data. And this is, happens independently from the level of confidentiality. So personal data of citizens, uh, including, uh, as I said, health information, which are extremely confidential, are at risk. And what is worse are used to make money. So, uh, and this has been confirmed by a recent sentence from the Court of Justice of the European Union. It's called Schrems II uh, from uh, the person that uh, raised the issue. Uh, which is the issue is uh, the use of uh, standard uh, common, uh, the commercial clauses, contractual clauses uh, in software. So uh, when we uh, use the software, we usually approve uh, a license. If the license is proprietary, the license is not written for the benefit of the user, is written to protect the software company. So uh, as you see, the, the smaller the companies, the lower the awareness of uh, the issues related to standard contractual clauses. Um, just to give you an, uh, a couple of examples, if you use Microsoft Office, the standard clause tells you that you cannot use the font provided by Microsoft Office with uh, another software because their license, uh, which basically you don't know you are approving, is strictly connected to the Microsoft Office license. Or uh, um, in some cases, you cannot use the software to do something uh, uh, because that is, uh, for instance, in the past, uh, you could not use uh, uh, Internet Explorer uh, to edit online uh, by criticizing Microsoft. And this was, of course, deep into the Internet Explorer um, and user license agreement. Uh, the clause is not there anymore, but there are other clauses that are uh, as bad as this one. So uh, this is the way that we the just by letting uh, standard contractual clauses uh, in the contracts in a way that they are not easy to understand uh, uh, apart from legal lawyers uh, we are uh, in a in a in a way we are uh, um, forced to uh, stick to the rules set by the large IT companies. Uh, so what changes if the software was free open source? 
free open source is transparent. The license is transparent. We share the source code. We share the methodologies used by uh, managed data. But unfortunately, uh, the maturity in the, the maturity of uh, open source adoptions in the uh, European Commission, as you see, is not so high. Uh, you see that the major, the, the, there is an imbalance in this chart uh, towards uh, no open source or uh, uh, ad hoc open source, uh, uh, while open source is seldom used to drive change, which would be the way to go. So what would change with free open source? Uh, the European government would regain control of our data, manage them according to their confidentiality, moving from proprietary to standard document format, and therefore uh, triggering uh, interoperability, which means uh, share data, share information in a transparent way, and share what and, and uh, share uh, documents uh, in a format that is uh, exactly the same independently from the operating system, the platform, uh, the version of the software. Uh, you are using. Uh, this seems a no-brainer, but unfortunately, politicians are, are not technology experts. And what is worse, they see large companies as part of the global system. So they see these issues uh, as issues for the system, which uh, um, and they try to help the large companies, instead of saying, uh, sorry, guys, you are not respecting users with your uh, behavior. And therefore, your behavior is deprecated, and we go a different way. They don't see free open source software as a part of the global system. And therefore, in many cases, I would say most cases, they ignore flaws as a potential solution. And with this attitude, they, for instance, they, uh, they create this issue. Uh, in 2011, in 2010, let's say the, the German government uh, perceived the problem with uh, the document used in uh, malware attacks. And as you can see, uh, this uh, is a, a research done by Symantec, so not an open source company. As you see the, the, the extensions which are in this chart, no one is an open source software. No one is an open standard. Also because uh, the issue is that ISO has shown that they cannot Unfortunately, they cannot be used as a steward of open standard as they don't dig into the issues that uh, pseudo standard have. So at the moment we, we get, uh, we have uh, at least two pseudo standards. One is PDF and the other is Office Open XML, which is uh, the Microsoft Office format. And uh, you can say, but in 2011, they found it, so the problem are solved. So in 2019, Kaspersky Lab, another not open source company, revealed that 70% of the attacks were with office documents. And uh, of course, there are uh, other uh, other tools uh, to bring attacks, but 70% out of 100% is just huge. And this is uh, because the, the documents, uh, and we will see it uh, uh, in, a, in a short while, are uh, artificially uh, complex, exactly because the complexity uh, 
increases the level of lock-in. So to keep the lock-in, uh, they have to maintain an artificial complexity and the artificial complexity makes these documents weaker in terms of security. And if you look at the uh, fixes of vulnerability by free open source software, you see that uh, the majority, the vast majority is uh, um, fixed in a week or less and uh, another 18% in a month or less, only 9% takes uh, more than uh, one month. And uh, this is a key figure because uh, if you are not uh, uh, familiar with uh, vulnerabilities management, vulnerabilities are first announced uh, and communicated to software companies that usually have uh, a couple of months before the vulnerability is disclosed to the public. So if vulnerabilities are solved in a month or less, which means 91% in the case of free software, uh, they will never reach the user. Uh, this, these percentages do not apply to proprietary software. And there are projects by Free Software Foundation Europe that say that software used in, uh, in the public environment, so by government should, and paid by public mo money should be open source. Uh, some governments are um, uh, using this or are trying to switch to this model, but it's still a minority. And uh, Let's see now what happens uh, about standards and interoperability. So interoperability is the ability of uh, sharing data and information in a transparent way. Unfortunately, only the people that are uh, using uh, open standards know what interoperability means or have experienced interoperability because the reality is that the other people use they people using Microsoft Office document formats. They don't know what interoperability means because they are sharing proprietary data, which uh, can be accessed only if you uh, update to the last version of the software or you buy the last version of the software. Uh, when uh, HTML was uh, released and in, in uh, uh, back in the, the 90s uh, the the it was a key moment because it was the time where we understood that content could be decoupled by uh, from uh, the uh, the product and HTML uh, thanks to the uh, World Wide Web Consortium as state uh, independent and standard uh government should be platform independent and uh, allow only document standard uh the reality is that tweak standard for citizens to pay a fee and uh, there is only this standard uh, uh, which is uh, uh the standard document format used by free open source software such as libreoffice and other uh, free open source software. Uh, Microsoft has promised that the next version of Microsoft Office will uh, support this uh, in, in, a, in the right way. We still have to see if this is true. Uh, which are the advantages of uh, an open document format? It's independent from a product is interoperable, allows transparent sharing of data, is neutral, is not related to a single product, and is perennial. So the standard is documented, so is a, is a, is a soft evolution, which doesn't make technology obsolete. Uh, and uh, which are the characteristics of uh, open document format? 
is solid and robust, is consistent across operating system, is interoperable and is predictable with this, which means that if I save a document uh, in this format, the document will always be the same independently from the operating system and the software I'm using. And what is locking? Of course, we have the we cannot read your document sticker from uh, Free Software Foundation, uh, which is a kind of a gimmick on the topic. But the reality is that Microsoft has published uh, a manual on how to lock in your clients. Uh, if you don't believe I have the PDF, I can share it. It was uh, in uh, on the Microsoft uh, website for uh, for years. Now they. I've started to hide it, but I'm almost sure that they have not deprecated it. Uh, and uh, uh, the lock-in, uh, of course, uh, is exactly the opposite of what you see now. Uh, what you see now is uh, uh, to have an interoperable file format, which means that the full software and as many software as you can think use the same format and uh, help the user to stay completely independent uh, from the choice of the software uh, to represent uh, uh, is uh, content. So sharing of content uh, is uh, basically managed and governed by the user. Let's look at a little bit and quickly at the difference between the two standards. So I, uh, Office of NXML has not an official uh, uh, logo. So a nice uh, Greek uh, uh, guy designed this logo. And uh, uh, I'm really happy that it used bananas because bananas are the only thing that I don't eat. So for me, having a logo made with bananas has even a worse uh, meaning that it has for uh, uh, people that love bananas. I, I find bananas disgusting. So this logo is uh, disgusting as much as the product that it represents. Uh, so let's uh, make it clear one thing that uh, when uh, Office Open XML was approved uh, in 2008, it was approved in a transitional version that was uh, considered to be a bridge to the strict version, uh, which is the standard. The reality is that uh, the strict version has been implemented only in some version of Microsoft Office, and uh, but in any case, uh, is the last option on the Save As menu of Microsoft Office. So uh, basically, uh, users are not aware of the existence of the strict format and uh, uh, therefore 100 percent of the office of an xml files available are proprietary and not standard this is the standard support uh, so uh, office for macintosh does not support strict 365 does not support strict uh, which is the philosophy of uh, Office of an XML is to uh, support Microsoft product and interoperate within the Microsoft environment. Uh, basically, uh, nothing has been done to interoperate with uh, uh, non Microsoft product. On the contrary, ODF was developed to be completely vendor neutral. And uh, uh, Although this means that the software had to be tweaked to, to be compatible with ODF, uh, uh, software developers gladly uh, adopted the standard because of the advantages that were uh, integrated with the standard. So uh, the difference is that ODF uh, is uh, designed, uh, uh, has been designed uh, for the future, so has been designed uh, to help users to share their contents for the next 20 to 50 years, which means uh, up to more or less uh, uh, the, the half of this uh, century, 
while uh, Office of XML was designed to propagate the issues of uh, the Microsoft Office proprietary documents for the next 20 to 50 years. So basically, it was uh, designed to have uh, in 2000, in 2050, exactly the same issues that we used to have in the in the 80s. And it's, uh, I will make a very quick example. If uh, you save uh, the famous to be or not to be, that is the question Shakespeare uh, sentence in uh, uh, office, uh, open document text, you always get the same uh, sentence, the same uh, string where you have uh, human readable XML tags, text, style, P1 is paragraph one. While if you save them uh, uh, using uh, uh, Microsoft Office, you have one version in 2018, a different one in 2019, and another one in 2020. And each one of them has uh, human unreadable XML tags, because uh, you have a, instead of text, you have a, a, a W. Uh, you have uh, that XML space preserved that shouldn't be with HTML, with XML at all. And uh, that is just a basic example. But believe me, if you look at the schema, uh, XML schema of Microsoft Office, uh, you will get an headache. Basically, uh, Microsoft Office XML does not um, follow any of the XML design, uh, uh, the basic design uh, uh, principles. So uh, makes it difficult to read it, uh, makes it uh, uh, a problem to parse for software. It is true that tags uh, are shorter, uh, but the reality is that uh, shorter tags have to be redefined uh, by every other software that reads the format, while uh, ODF naming is exactly as uh, specified by the XML convention. And this makes interoperability uh, easier. So, uh, 80% of Office Open XML documentation reinvents the wheel in the sense that uh, it's describing proprietary Microsoft formats instead of used instead of standards. Uh, it uh, describes uh, the convoluted XML schema and the proprietary elements that are used uh, uh, for uh, Microsoft Office. Uh, let's say that uh, if I uh, an analyze that as a, uh, uh, in a naive way, uh, would say that all LibreOffice developers are geniuses because they are developing a, a, a format that are using a format which makes it easy for users to read it. And, uh, and Microsoft developers are uh, idiots because they're not doing it. But the reality is that the, uh, the files are artificially filled with uh, con uh, unnecessary contents to reduce the chances that software other than Microsoft can open them in, in the right way. Uh, Microsoft uh, has the clear interest of uh, opposing interoperability to protect the market that is worth $25 billion and is predict, projected to grow to $30 billion by 2025. So documents created with Microsoft Office are standard on paper, but the reality is that they are built to fool users. And this is uh, where you have the simplicity of, of ODF ODT, or ODT in the case of text, and the uh, hidden complexity of op Office of an XML, hidden complexity that people is not seeing because they should uh, uh, look uh, at the content of the files, which is something that uh, 
users are not doing. Uh, so complexity is a strategy, is the deliberate distribution of uh, ambiguous, confusing or misleading information. And uh, uh, the, this deliberate complexity uh, makes content sharing difficult for end users. They don't realize that they are using a software that has been uh, developed, thought, conceived to make uh, interoperability a problem. And of course, uh, this fact, it's not just uh, creating this uh, content sharing issues, but it's also disqualifying the idea of document standard as inefficient and cumbersome because Office OpenXML is uh, described by Microsoft as a standard. So uh, you see here exactly the, the point of contact with the, the surveillance capitalism we were uh, discussing uh, when I started the presentation. This is a market strategy, it's not a technology. The uh, prosecution of the surveillance capitalism is not inevitable. We as users can do something, government can help us in doing something. The business model is based on the wrong use of our personal data and, and in ways which are concealed from us. And this is the, the worst thing. We, we, they use our data, we don't know that they are using our data. Regulation can change the business model. Uh, it has to prohibit these practices and uh, it has to be enforced. GDPR was the first uh, break of this uh, model, but unfortunately was not enough. It's still a small one. So I think uh, I will end uh, with this uh, sentence uh, of uh, Professor Zuboff. Was it a stake here is the human expectation of sovereignty over one's own life and authorship of one's own experience, which means that uh, they are trying to limit our expectation of freedom of being free to uh, control uh, our life and especially uh, of uh, control uh, the sharing of our uh, uh, information because the collective uh, intelligence of the community at large is, some, is, uh, is a little bit frightening and I can understand for companies and uh, and governments, but we should really defend it. These are the sources of information and I really invite you to look at them. And uh, thank you for listening, stopping sharing my screen uh, now and uh, just to go back to my face. And uh, if you have questions and uh, I hope it was clear and uh, thank you for listening again. Mr. Vignoli, thank you very much for your enlightening talk. I would say uh, you were suspecting uh, about the expectations. You far exceeded at least my expectations. So thank you very much. I will now uh, call if there are any questions, either from the, oh, yes, please. Professor Pevich, please. Okay, thank you. So as expected, far above our expectations. So there is one fun fact. Uh, uh, you mentioned genome names and Excel problem with it. And actually regarding that problem, Nadit informed me uh, a couple of years ago, and I tried to resolve that using LibreOffice Calc. And actually she tweeted something about that. Maybe we can share that, okay? Can you share that? And it turned out that LibreOffice Calc, uh, what's that? No, 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 no. Uh, they cannot share that at the moment. 
but actually Nadica uh, tweeted that that uh, there was no problem just uh, avoid Excel and use LibreOffice Calc and everything is fine and you don't have to rename genome uh, units uh, unit names so we had that uh, I believe a couple of years ago Nadica can you hear me Nadica could you join us you are muted Nadica yes. Yes, I can join you. I am trying to reach the the link. I think I will share it in a moment so that, that everyone a can years see. Ago. That happened a couple of years ago. That, that actually, we were in mental resonance regarding the topic, and it seems that LibreOffice Calc uh, had no issue regarding genome names. It, yeah, because you can configure the way it imports the names. Yeah, exactly. And that's it. That's it. Well, so actually, uh, my question or more uh, comments, we have sort of enough time, I hope. <clears throat> and there was a TV show uh, a couple of days ago here regarding, um, uh, regarding Facebook outage. And they used the term digital sovereignty, but uh, that term was used in quite a different way, in quite a different meaning. Me uh, they use it in meaning that uh, digital sovereignty is something like control internet content over uh, certain territory which is quite different than your meaning of digital sovereignty you define that at the beginning and i believe that's important because digital sovereignty can be expressed as you know some sort of censorship and on the other hand uh, the basic idea of your meaning of the world is quite opposite you know to have people in control of uh, their digital lives Am I right? Uh, yes. Unfortunately, you know, the problem is that in this, er in this area, uh, there is a lot of confusion. Unfortunately, what I always say is that to understand uh, the issue in full, uh, you have uh, to get into technology. You have to, to, to start talking a little bit about technology because the, the surface uh, doesn't, doesn't explain anything or explains what people want to understand. So, you know, there, there are people that are uh, sharing on Facebook, uh, uh, I would say, whatever. And then uh, they, they complain because they get advertising about, uh, you know, their uh, seven-year-old children, uh, uh, toys for uh, seven-year-old children. And they say, yeah, how the, the hell they know and then you look at their profile and you see 100 pictures of their seven-year-old children. And, uh, the, and no one uh, uh, explain here, I think education is where uh, the, the world has been really faulty. Uh, and uh, I'm, um, I think, uh, and, and, and of course I'm not blaming uh, the educators. I'm blaming uh, the ministries of education because if you are a ministry of education and sorry, but I'm telling this in public at every conference. So I'm, uh, and the ministry of education of Italy actually hates me, uh, but the ministry of education uh, is exactly in the sweet spot that has to protect and drive the education in the right way, in the right direction. And you cannot expect that a single teacher or a single professor is able to do it by himself. Yes, there are people that are able and understand the issue, but the problem is that the issue should be shared with the education, with the pedagogic, the educational community. The community should be aware that there is an, a problem of uh, lack of education uh, starting from uh, primary schools. We, we made, uh, we, we, uh, in, in Italy, we, we have an association uh, uh, that is uh, also working, it was working, uh, in the last two years it's impossible, but it was working with schools, uh, with seminars about uh, digital sovereignty and document freedom. And I can tell you that uh, young students, primary school students, five, six, seven, eight years old, they get the issue in one hour when we have to explain it to the parents. We, we took two or three hours 
to explain the same topic because uh, the young people do not have any any background uh, about the topic so if uh, you explain them about the freedom of a document they get it immediately while uh, people that has been used for 30, 20 30 10 years not to use free documents uh, uh, as a background that tells exactly the opposite and i think that in general we should have uh, i've discussed this with unesco for instance i told to unesco people you should start a campaign of educating because you are a super national organization you should start educating people about or governments about the fact that digital education real one not driven by companies is uh, man should be mandatory because uh, students today but even students yesterday for the next 50 years we, they will have to deal with digital documents so if they are not able to understand digital documents uh, they will be slaves of the people that are able to understand digital documents that's really simple it's uh, you know it's like uh, in uh, if we go back to the middle age the culture was in the hands of people being able to speak latin which were a handful and uh, we are reproducing exactly the situation of uh, 1000 years ago where the people that are able to speak digital today are the ones that control the uh, the culture unfortunately companies uh, can pay the, these people and so they hire these people and we should uh, put these people in universities in schools everywhere to teach and provide a different opinion sorry to be really blunt on this but uh, having uh, uh, i i am over 67 and uh, i think i have not that much time to 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 provide this message so every year that passes i will become uh, more blunt on uh, on this uh, i would like to meet a ministry of education and i would like to explain him that is not doing his job today or is doing it partially not to the full extent okay i'm really happy that i initiated this speech of yours and i totally agree <laughs> okay thank you very much uh, just a second can we share that uh, posting now yeah uh, yes we can i'm sorry for the delay that was there here is how you can enter uh, uh participants uh, uh, can you say uh, that was august 2020 okay a year ago no yes yeah okay okay so we posted that you know regarding uh regarding uh, genome in calc okay this is the movie where I typed something and it seems that everything is fine, everything works fine. So there was a solution, simple solution. You don't have to rename uh, basis for genome code. Okay, uh, next question is sort of mathematical one, meaning it is quite known in mathematics and even in my area in power electronics that the global optimum is not a simple union of local optima. Oh, this is sort of technical, but it doesn't matter anyhow. Could you imagine that money spent on lobby expenses is being used for free software development? Where we can be? Oh, it's difficult to believe because uh, if you think that, uh, let's take uh, an example that I know quite well, which is LibreOffice and the cost of developing LibreOffice. So if uh, we look at uh, the cost of developing LibreOffice today, we can say that maintaining that uh, is about uh, two million dollars per year okay uh, maintaining and um, the cost of all the developers that are paid then we have volunteers but with paid developers uh, paid developers are uh, doing uh, 70 percent of the job so two million let's add another 30 percent which is uh, uh, so 2.5 million dollars per year of development and we are talking about 32 million dollars per year in uh, in uh, lobbying only in brussels so you can uh, it making the proportion is 
really difficult. I mean, uh, we are talking about a factor of 10 bigger because uh, 2.5 to, to 32. So let's say that is just to, to, to make it simple. Let's say that developing LibreOffice costs $3.2 million per year. And we have a $32 million per year, so 10 times as much spent in lobbying. Uh, so basically, I, I couldn't even imagine what we could do by having $32 million. We probably would say it's too much. Sorry, we don't know how to spend that money. But think about... Uh, uh, Picking other products like Thunderbird, like uh, Firefox, uh, like Chromium, uh, like uh, GIMP, uh, like Inkscape. And uh, all of this, invest those 32 million on this uh, uh, and uh, provide uh, development. Uh, and not only development, because in some cases, let's, for instance, in some cases, this software need also some marketing help. GIMP, for instance, sorry, but the name uh, is uh, just, uh, uh, is a sin. Uh, you cannot call a software uh, GNU image processing. Uh, it's, come on, call it uh, whatever, uh, Gauguin, uh, Van Gogh, uh, or uh, any other name that, or a fantasy name. But so some marketing could help some of the software. But just be, just imagine what uh, a product like Thunderbird could do with uh, adding uh, a couple of million dollars to the development in terms of security. Uh, it's already secure. I mean, it's already doing a good job in terms of security. But just imagine what it could do with a, with a team of uh, experts about security helping uh, the development, so making uh, cryptography really end user um, accessible. And when I mean end user, I mean uh, normal user, accessible by normal users. Uh, it's, it's really goes beyond imagination, spending that money on free software on, or free hardware goes beyond imagination. Uh, let's uh, just make uh, uh, this uh, is uh, the Librem 5 uh, phone, is a Linux phone. And uh, it's developed by one single company, Purisma, in the States. And uh, I, I, I bought it uh, because it was a crowdfunding project. Just imagine to give these people. Uh, the same, um, double the amount of money that they collected with crowdfunding and uh, make the, actually the phone it's working, uh, but it's not comparable with my normal phone, which is uh, this one and is Android. But it's interesting, you can start doing something. For instance, you have a switch for uh, Bluetooth, you have a switch for, uh, or you can switch off all the, all the networks which is something that you cannot do on, on, on Android phones. So just imagine uh, uh, the advantages that some people could have by having uh, a Linux phone, which is uh, a state of the art in terms of technology, instead of uh, just running behind technology because the amount of money available for development is limited. I think that moving to open source would really open incredible scenarios to, to, to our, uh, and we should invest part of that money in education. I really think that we should spend a lot more money in education. And again, I'm not blaming any, any professor, any teacher, and I'm not blaming anyone in the Ministry of Education, but I'm blam blaming the people that are taking decisions because they listen to Microsoft and they don't listen to us. This is what happens in Italy, but I think it what happens in every other European company, country, sorry. Okay, many thanks. You, you convinced me even more that uh, when it comes to software development as a society, we are not efficient. More money spent on lobbying than on software development. 
and actually that's amazing which is built out of such a low amount of money invested in open source uh, okay um, it seems that optimizing for profit made george orwell a uh, great profit meaning uh, great uh, predictor of future it seems that uh, orwell predicted our digital lives much better before digital time so that's something inherent to uh, human nature that's something in human nature okay mr secretary of state i hope that you enjoyed the speech so i expect you either to be ignored or to be expelled and actually I expect both to happen since you're competent. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you. We uh, thank you, Professor. We have another question also from the audience. Maybe we can call now Professor Gerasov uh, from North Macedonia to join us. Uh, thanks. Uh, Branislav here from uh, Skopje, Macedonia. Uh, Mr. Vignoli, thanks for your lecture. It was really an eye opener. I also enjoyed your last year's keynote and people, even for me, who who is a free software enthusiast, let's say, uh, it was the first time I heard all this uh, battle of the standards and uh, indeed it's very, it's very kind of evil, no? Uh, I mean, it's uh, profit motivated, not really, uh, uh, it's not for the good of humanity or anything. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll, I have two questions. One question is, um, about uh, pushing uh, the open document uh, standard in the European Union. So at the moment, uh, when we apply for projects, uh, the templates for the documents are in a rich text format. I think it's a format that has been a long time uh, surpassed. So are you tackling this front? Or, uh, what are your actions in, in this area? Uh, so the uh, actually RTF uh, uh, has never been a standard uh, was called standard by Microsoft uh, but to be a standard you have to do more than call uh, something a standard otherwise uh, I, I can say that I'm the standard for the beauty of men's and uh, people that is not like me is ugly um, just by saying that I'm better than anyone else, you know, but so anyway, uh, actually RTF is a terrible format uh, because uh, it does not, it does also, uh, which is typical for Microsoft, uh, multiple versions which are not documented. So you can have uh, probably a, around 20 version of RTF uh, should be absolutely deprecated and never used for anything hmm. uh, i would say that uh, docx is far better than uh, than although it has huge issues but is far better than rtf hmm. in in general um, what we are doing difficult to see the problem is that we are trying to educate people you know the the the, the option that we have uh, are uh, two, I think. The first one is unethical, is uh, kill all the people that are in one position, a certain position. But uh, let's say ethics uh, do not allow to take this uh, solution. So we try to take the other one, which is educate people that are in a certain position. We try to do this. Uh, unfortunately, we do this uh, without a lot of money. Hmm. And uh, in the reality is that when you operate at a certain level, money is key. So uh, I can be as good as I can, uh, or I try to be uh, as good as I can uh, in uh, convincing people. But I can tell you that if uh, uh, I was, uh, let's say, psychologically, not saying that I'm doing anything wrong, but psychologically, I'm representing uh, a movement that has no money. And mm. the same person that represents a, a company that has uh, $30 billion in cash, uh, psychologically, the perception is completely different. And unfortunately, we cannot do anything against this. Uh, the only thing that we can do is to work together. Mm. Because of course, if we are many, many voices on the same topic, uh, will change something this is what happened uh, for the 
for GDPR. This is what happened for the Schrems uh, sentence at the European Court. Uh, there were multiple voices asking for uh, clarification. And if many voices ask for clarification, then they have to dig into the issue. Mm -hmm. and if they have to dig into the issue, then we have the technical details that can really convince uh, everyone. The problem is that uh, we have to work together. The, I don't have any other solution, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. We have to work together. We have to, 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 ex to educate people. So I think that the scientific community will will definitely support you in uh, in a petition or any form of uh, document you can uh, use for pressuring a bit uh, the European Union. Especially, I think it will. It's also very very um, likely to happen because uh, recently the European Union has moved, at least in the science funding front. It has moved towards uh, open access publishing and uh, open source software. So I think there is kind of a momentum that uh, that can be used to, to push through with uh, the ODT uh, standard. Yeah, we, we are trying to work with that, yes. Mm. Okay, and uh, the second question is, um, um, I noticed recently, I don't know uh, how recent it is, but um, you've, uh, you've added kind of um, um, tech support so like a, a business tier to to the to LibreOffice, which I think is a good move uh, is something that Red Hat has uh, used to be one of the most successful open source companies and is a good route to get some extra funding for all your activities. So maybe a comment on this, how it's going. Uh, are there many companies opting in for this service or it's still kind of beginning? Uh, the reality is that we 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 choose that model when we founded the the project. The uh, unfortunately, there are many companies that are uh, and still uh, the number is still large that are uh, uh, using the free version without giving back anything. And we say giving back uh, means uh, uh, find a way. Uh, to, to fund the project is not just because you can buy the time of developers to solve bugs. Uh, you can buy the time of developers to, to develop features. You can buy an, an LTS version to which is a long-term supported. And of course uh, it needs a professional level three support. Uh, the problem is that many Many large organizations do not are not uh, are le just leveraging the free software, mm -hmm. uh, and this is a we, yes we have seen a small increase uh, uh, since because last year we we did a campaign and we are still uh, investing in this, uh, uh, but the, the unfortunately uh, companies should be more responsible when deploying. Uh, uh, free software, because they they cannot think that uh, uh, developers of free software do not pay their bills at the end of the month, uh, do not pay their, uh, uh, they, they don't have to buy a house or to rent a house, uh, mm. they don't eat, uh, they don't have a car, uh, we are normal, I'm not a developer anyway, but any, we are normal people like anyone else. We need a social life and uh, we need someone that gives us money mm -hmm. for our social life. So this, I think, uh, should be easy to understand. And mm -hmm. uh, as I said, we don't expect uh, to get as much money as uh, proprietary companies get, but we need some more money mm -hmm. because uh, LibreOffice has a huge potential and we would like to see the potential developed uh, uh, at its full uh, power. Mm -hmm. OK, grazie. Thank you. Um, we have a last question. Uh, I hope the titolo can stay a little bit longer because no our secretary is interested in <laughs> asking the question. Yeah, next year I will be in Belgrade, I hope. Looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and uh, the question is, uh, well, 
I understand your uh, your presentation in some kind of uh, call to action. Let's say, let's put it that way. <clears throat> and I I would be interested to, to hear your opinion on. Uh, we have more and more moving uh, cases of moving from capex to opex. And what would be the let's say, for example, uh, a search engine that you numbered uh, collecting data and everything. What would be the proper answer from the free and open source community when we come in question with the services, such as a search engine, for example? So the problem is that, uh, uh, so we, I think that we can split the problem into uh, first uh, is uh, to use services which are uh, not dependent from one company, which I think uh, is uh, one solution. And the second solution is to uh, talk with companies and uh, just say, tell to these companies, we have standards, we have transparency. So either you adhere, you respect standard and transparency or uh, uh, your business will be more difficult in our uh, environment. Because I, 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 I'm not against the companies. Uh, so I don't, I, I'm not against Google, I'm not against Microsoft, I'm against their practices. So government should rule practices in a way that makes these practices acceptable. So uh, let's say, for instance, you gather my data, okay. You sell advertising, okay. Let's agree on which data you can use to sell advertising. Uh, if, uh, for instance, uh, you uh, you use the fact that I'm, tomorrow I will be in Bolzano to sell advertising to hotels, fair enough. It's uh, I don't see this as a real intrusion into my private life. But if you sell the fact that I have arthrosis on my left hand to sell me, um, you know, medical equipment, that I see a, an issue. So let's agree on which data you can use to sell advertising and which data are my own data and you have to ask me before you use them to sell advertising. I don't want, I'm not against companies. I want the companies to do their business. I think that we are in an economy where uh, companies have to do profit. Okay, they have to do profit respecting the users and the citizens. This uh, and I, I think that they don't respect users and citizens. They see users and citizens are pro as products. Let's move to see users and citizens are individuals, human beings, and then uh, we can start discussing again. Uh, so I'm not just to I I of course I'm for open source software. I think that we can find a, a good balance between open source and proprietary, provided that proprietary respects the individual. So there's no hidden tricks in the proprietary software. If the format is transparent, so let's use Office Open XML. I don't mind if it is a real open, a real open standard. I would be absolutely in favor of using uh, an open standard if even if i'm i'm not supporting it in principle because it's an open standard uh, but why for instance electricity is respected by everyone uh, and software is not uh, with electricity i can come with uh, any um, i don't have a, an adapter in under my hands but if i can come with my uh, a, a power adapter for my laptop uh, to Belgrade, uh, plug it in, it works. Uh, I go to the States, uh, yes, I need the interface, which is the plug. But once the plug, uh, I, I got the interface, then uh, the power adapter works. Why they respect this kind of uh, uh, standards and they don't respect software because software allows to hide, to make tricks, while electricity doesn't allow to make tricks. Just imagine that you make a, a fantastic computer that needs uh, 380 volts uh, uh, electricity. You could not use it anywhere. 
so you don't do it. So let's uh, move from open, let's treat, op let's manage open standards as if they were hardware standards, where uh, you have a kind of interface that forces you to, to, to stick to the standard. Otherwise, it doesn't work. It should be exactly the same. Why in, in software standards you, you do your dirty tricks because no one looks at the standard or no one is able to see the standard? So let's uh, Jeff Bezos to be the most rich uh, man in the world. I don't mind. I'm, I'm not envious of Jeff Bezos. But if he avoids tracking my health uh, through the purchase that I do through Amazon, I would be happier for Jeff Bezos to be the richest man of the world. And as he tracks my my purchases and makes me a profile under the health point of view, I'm not happy at all. And uh, that's the situation. And uh, yes, I isn't think- it, Isn't it the part of GDPR, as you mentioned, that the part of a solution or using something else? Par yes, partially, because, uh, you know, the problem is that, yes, I can ask Amazon to withdraw all my data, but then I cannot do any purchase anymore. So, you know, uh, Amazon, uh, in the case of Amazon is convenient. Google, in the case of Google is convenient because you have a very efficient search engine. So, okay, they have developed very good product in terms of uh, e-commerce on one side, uh, search engine on the other. Apple for the hardware, people is happy about Apple for the hardware, okay. But why you have to provide Apple uh, your uh, uh, details uh, to, to, do pur to purchase uh, additional hardware through the Apple store? That is, that is unfair. And, and they say, because give us your data because we serve you better. That was uh, day one. Day two was uh, give us our data because we can sell you more and our customers and partners can sell you more and can sell you stuff uh, that uh, uh, it's private. And, you know, we, we, we went uh, beyond the threshold uh, and at first it was um, convenient for everyone uh, to rely on these companies. Uh, for uh, the digital ma management of the digital uh, infrastructure. The problem is that th these companies should have been uh, managed, not, uh, and, and again, uh, governments should have, should have been able to say, guys, you are exceeding your power. So we want you to disclose what you are uh, uh, you are uh, um, profiling from people what you are the data you are collecting from people, and we want you. You should disclose how you are using them. Just imagine if all the people were aware of what Google is doing with their with their stuff, with what with Facebook is doing with the picture, and uh, and then uh, you probably would see a a, a different attitude. So I think. Uh, uh, do not go 100% open source, even if I would be absolutely happy, but use uh, good old common sense in whatever you do. And good old common sense says that someone else having all your data and using them uh, without your consent is something that no one would accept in the world. Yes, thank you very much for your answers. Okay, and Vignoli, of course, next year we will not take any excuse for granted. Not no, but the, anything the, else. So. Uh, this year was yeah, sorry, yeah. but it was the it was Serbia that didn't want me. I don't know why. <laughs> I, if you want, I can write a letter to the prime minister and say why you didn't want me in Belgrade. I would do that. I don't. I'm not scared by the prime minister. Uh, and you of course. I am, I am vaccinated. I could do a Schwab because that is reasonable. So why they asked me to do to five days of uh, quarantine, uh, it, which for someone that is still working, it's 
something that is you cannot deal with that so i last weekend i was in germany and of course they asked me in my green pass it's okay fair they want to be sure that i'm uh, so even in this uh, europe should be europe not uh, Serbia is a little bit different, Italy is a little bit different, and we should be, I mean, we are exactly, we speak, um, let's say, a common language, which is English. I totally respect your native language, which is Serbian, and uh, as much as I expect that you respect my native language, which is Italian, but uh, let's say that we are, Europe should really be not one country, but should be a real federation of countries that help each other. Otherwise, come on, we go back 1,000 years. As I was saying, we go back 1,000 years when uh, uh, each castle had its own, uh, you know, king or... Uh, I wouldn't like that. Thank you. I agree. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Let's hear thank you. Round of applause. Yeah. We do okay. have... No, that that's it. We we are finished session. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. was longer than expected, but I. No, thank you. You know, I speak a lot. That's okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> we enjoyed, enjoyed it. Your anyway, so bye bye, bye guys. guys. Just one round of applause for Mr. Yeah. Thank you. And bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks for being with us. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Nadita. Uh, we are having a break and we will take it until 12 and 15.